This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 104, Heaven Watkins, part two. Last week, I told you the story of Heaven Watkins, an 11-year-old autistic girl with cerebral palsy who was well known to the child protection system in her home state of Minnesota. When her family moved to Virginia, however, Heaven fell off the radar of those tasked with protecting children, and despite the warnings of concerned family members, Heaven was beaten to death in May of 2018 by her mother and her live-in boyfriend. In this episode, you'll hear my conversation with Heaven's aunt and kinship caregiver, Dr. Sharonda Orridge, an incredibly accomplished woman who has never stopped fighting for her special niece and whose efforts have paved the way for new laws to help better protect other children like Heaven. This is part two of the tragic story of Heaven Watkins. If you haven't yet listened to episode 103, the first part of Heaven's story, I recommend going back and listening to that episode first. Before I get started, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Kimberly M. from Raymond, New Hampshire, Brandy B. from Denver, Colorado, Megan I. from Spokane, Washington, and from Green Gables, Naomi C. and Candace. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to make a pledge to help me keep the show going, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. There are also a few things I didn't include in last week's episode that I'd be remiss not to talk about today. First, I thought it was worth mentioning that a man in Virginia named Shedrick Thorne created a GoFundMe using Heaven's name, claiming he would use the funds to create a community center of some sort called Heaven in the Hoods, all one word. The GoFundMe campaign read, Heaven Watkins was murdered by her mother and boyfriend. She also created a government law, which is Heaven's law, for artistic and abused children. I assume he meant autistic. He went on to say that he would be the CEO and mentor of the community center, in which classes are held, also fun, games, and other kid activities will take place in a positive environment for children. The campaign has raised $944 of its $8,000 goal, I'm only mentioning this because it feels completely sketchy to me, and when Sharonda mentioned it to me, I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to figure out what the deal is with this guy. She told me that when Heaven died, people started asking her if her brother was in Virginia because there was a man claiming to be Heaven's father and asking for donations. Even reporter Laura Geller mentioned it to Sharonda. He's apparently been trying to collect money in Heaven's name since 2018. Mr. Thorne also has a YouTube channel, mostly filled with his musical stylings, but I found one selfie video he appears to have filmed in a strip mall parking lot in which he discusses his Heaven in the Hoods project. Good evening, this is Travel LA, and I'm out here trying to create unity with Heaven in the Hoods. We need to teach the kids not to be afraid of people that's abusing them because some of them don't know how to do it. They're afraid. The person might tell them that they're going to kill them, that they're going to kill their family. And we need to help people, man. This Travel LA. You know, from heaven in the hoods. And we just got to help them, man. How you doing, sir? Would you like to donate anything to heaven in the hoods? Uh, see? You know, I ask people, you know, and I even try to um, get people to donate just one cent, man. You know what I'm saying? To heaven in the hoods. You know, so we can teach some kids. We got to help each other. We got to pray for each other. We got to lift each other up, man. If we don't lift each other up and help each other, all them kids going to die. We ain't going to have no unity out here amongst each other. See these cars right here? They got unity. See those stores? They got unity. See this concrete right here? They got unity. See those trees over there? They got unity. Even the stoplights got unity. But what about us? 
Arabs got unity, Chinese people got unity, um, you know, Mexicans got unity, Africans got unity, Jamaicans got unity. You know, but what about the black race? The black African American people. No unity amongst each other. We gotta help each other, man. We gotta help these kids, man. The youth. If we don't help them, then I guess, you know, it's so it's gonna be all over, man. So Travel LA. God bless you. Heaven in the hood. Peace. First of all, a fucking pardon? Googling Heaven in the Hoods reveals what looks like a house at 803A Avenue in Norfolk, Virginia, and a red banner indicates the business is permanently closed, although the GoFundMe is still accepting donations. There are apparently two websites for the organization, both of which are very bare bones and give no information whatsoever. One of them refers to Heaven in the Hoods as a camp, and that website features a five-star customer testimonial apparently written by Shedrick Thorne himself under his street name, Travel LA. The other website calls Heaven in the Hoods an education center and lists its address as West Ballview Avenue, the same street where Heaven died, but doesn't specify an actual address. According to Mr. Thorne's Facebook profile, or one of the several he appears to maintain, he is apparently writing a book about his Heaven in the Hoods project, although it's not clear what the book will actually be about. On one of his Facebook profiles, he lists his name as Heaven, Heaven in the Hoods, Watkins. In multiple posts, he refers to the real Heaven Watkins as his spiritual daughter. A quick search of the Virginia Judiciary Online case portal shows that Mr. Thorne has been arrested several times for various offenses, including drug possession and trespassing. He's spent some time in prison for cocaine distribution and larceny, and four of his charges were from this year, including two separate drug possession charges and two charges of trespassing after forbidden, which in Virginia means someone remains on a property even after being told to leave by someone in authority. He also has a past conviction for criminal domestic violence, as well as charges for firearm-related offenses, frequenting a drug house, soliciting in the street, resisting arrest, driving with a suspended license, and a wide variety of related traffic offenses, and disorderly conduct. Mr. Thorne's motives sound reasonable enough, wanting to help abuse children, but there's something very off-putting about his approach. Supporting worthy causes is important, but be careful who you're giving your money to. On a more positive note, a quick shout-out to Jackie Thomas, who helped Heaven's Aunt Sharonda fight to keep Heaven in her home. Sharonda said of Jackie, She also helped me put things in perspective. When I was reaching out to people, she said to me, I know you're upset and angry, but try to keep your emotions out of it, because they will use that against you. Another special person in Heaven's life was her paraprofessional, Miss Jessica, who adored Heaven. When Sharonda told Miss Jessica that Heaven was being returned to her mother, the paraprofessional started crying and had to excuse herself so the children wouldn't see. Miss Jessica said that Heaven was the reason she decided to go into special education, and in fact, she received her master's in special education the day after Heaven's death. I'll include a photo of Heaven with Miss Jessica in the Facebook photo album for this episode. Sharonda said everyone at Heaven's school, Linwood Global Arts Upper Campus, was wonderful. The family communicated back and forth with school staff using journals. The family wrote about how Heaven's morning was, and school staff wrote back about how her day went. School staff also helped Sharonda by writing letters during her fight to save her niece, as well as working with Heaven academically. When Heaven first started second grade, she was assessed as functioning at the level of a two- or three-year-old. By the time she entered third grade, she was assessed at a kindergarten level, and she had to be assigned new goals because she had already completed the ones set for her in her Individualized Education Program, or IEP. A lot of people fought for heaven, both while she was alive and after her untimely death, and they all deserve recognition for that. For this episode, I was honored to have a conversation with Heaven's aunt and biggest advocate, Dr. Sharonda Orridge, who has dedicated her life to making other people's lives better and to building strong, healthy communities. From her LinkedIn profile, as a direct result of her work with children and families, in 2004, Sharonda started a consulting business, Loving Spirit Community Consulting that focuses on issues and systems that directly impact the health of communities such as education, welfare, child protection, homelessness, and the justice systems. 
Sharonda has worked with various nonprofits, churches, public and charter schools in the Twin Cities as a community systems navigator to develop and implement curriculum and to facilitate learning on numerous topics, including employment search, self-esteem, goal setting, diversity, racial tolerance, parenting, teen pregnancy prevention, girl circles, cooking, nutrition, and spoken word. Sharonda, a very busy, multi-talented woman, has a bachelor's and a master's degree in metaphysical science, and she holds a Doctor of Philosophy PhD, specializing in holistic life coaching from the University of Sedona, where her profile describes her as a writer, spoken word artist, certified TOP facilitator, certified doula, motivational speaker, curriculum developer, and community organizer. She is also Heaven's number one advocate, both while she was alive and since, and has been instrumental in making real changes that affect real children. Sharonda is an inspiration, and it was a privilege to talk with her about the niece she loved so very much. After this quick break, you'll hear my conversation with Heaven's aunt, Sharonda. Today on the podcast, I have a special guest. I'm speaking with Heaven's aunt, Sharonda Orridge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So was it 2014 or 2015? 2015. It was 2015 when you took all three girls in? Yes. So I got Heaven first. February of 2015, Heaven came to me. And then March of 2015, the other two girls came to me. My other, my other two nieces, yeah, they came to me. At that point, what was going on with Latoya's son, with their older brother? He was given to her sister. And that's the, is that the same sister who was Heaven's PCA for a while? No, that's another sister. Yeah, the, the, the sister that w- was her PCA, they wasn't doing anything. The only thing they were doing was just collecting a check. They did not take Heaven to the doctor. They did not take her to the dentist. They didn't even do any follow-ups. She needed glasses and she needed to um, do occupational therapy and all of that stuff. Because when we got her, she was just learning to walk. Like she still was using her chair. Oh, wow. Uh, She was just like learning to, to walk real good and stuff. And my daughter took over as her PCA and my daughter wind up um, teaching her yoga and they were like doing swim therapy and, She taught her like different vocabulary words and stuff. We actually, she had an IEP and she actually finished everything that was on her IEP. They had to set higher goals for her. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And she, she graduated um, third grade and we went to her little graduation and everything. I think we got a picture of her with her little cap and gown. She was just so, she is funny. We talk about her every single day. It's not like a minute we don't think about her. My daughter, you know, she took heaven on like it was her child. She would buy her all these little frilly clothes and stuff like that. And she would have heaven help do chores and and she would give heaven an allowance. And so they were going downtown St. Paul so heaven could spend her allowance. And they were at the bus stop and she saw a lady with all her belongings on the ground. And Heaven walked up to her and said, why your stuff on the floor? And then my daughter was saying, no, Heaven, you don't do that. She was like, no, it's okay. She was like, oh, baby, I'm just looking for a house right now, you know. And then I, when I get a house, I'll be able to put my stuff in the house. And Heaven reached in her pocket and gave her her $5 and told her to go buy a house. Oh, that is so sweet. Yes. That's just the type. And that's why I don't understand. She was just, and she loved to sing. If she meets you, she'll just sing your name. And she was just a joy. She, she had her little mo- moments and stuff too, but she just like, she'll come home and she'll say, ah, T, somebody was cussing on the bus. I was like, who was cussing on the bus? Me. And she, <laughs> <laughs> One time I had, um, I was opening up some aspirin and some aspirin had squirted in my eye. So I had to go to the hospital. I think she was over at mom's house and she came and she didn't see my eye. And when she went to school, they had to put her in her little room, her little chair and stuff. She was crying. She thought my eye fell out. Oh, poor baby. Yeah, she could not see my eye. And she just, she said, my auntie don't have an eye no more. (laughs) 
<laughs> she seemed yes. like she was so caring about other people. She was. She was. I remember one time my, my leg was swollen and, and I she said, Auntie, can I help you? And I said, Yeah. And she was rubbing some cream. She said, Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> I saw one video of her that was a couple minutes. I think it was on your YouTube channel with her singing the letters. And yeah, she would just look like she would just sit on the on the couch and listen to smooth jazz and you know a scat and stuff like that. And um, we had a cat named Poetry, and that was her prime partner. I mean, we say heaven. What happened to the chocolate? Poetry ate it. Now she. <laughs> <laughs> Poetry ate all the chocolate, I tell you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> She's got a fall guy with four legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he used to always just jump up there with her. And then I used to chase him out her bed. And then one time she just say, it's okay. He just wants the color. It's okay. And I Aww. said, you sure? And she was like, yeah. So ever since then, poetry just be waiting for. It. And then when, when she actually left, I felt so bad for poetry because every time he hear the door and stuff, he runs to see if it's heaven. Yeah, sure. He got attached to her. Yep. And then he didn't see it was heaven. He'll, you'll see his head drop and he'll just walk back where he come from and stuff. Yeah. Oh, poor thing. Well, when she left, I know you had fought very hard to try yes. to keep her or at least slow the process down for yes. reunification. But. And, and they turned it against me and said, because they, they actually told me, well, when you see something, just say something. And half the stuff I didn't even say anything about. One time she was at home and she had all the kids except heaven. Heaven was still with us. And it was like six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and she's knocking on the side door and she has the two girls and her and she said somebody was at her house stabbing somebody and remember I stayed six houses down so I'm like where's your son and um she had left him in the house oh my god so my mom had called the police I went down there he came out and he ran to me and then I took him Immediately, I called her. Uh, I left a message with her worker. I wrote her um, her mentor. Um, she has she had like a parent helper. I emailed her. I emailed the supervisor and let them know what was going on. That Wednesday, when we went in court, they stood up and said she was doing everything she was supposed to do. Everything was on schedule. And I asked to speak, and the um, judge told me we don't do that here. So I wasn't I wasn't even able to speak. So what I did is I wrote a letter to the judge and the judge sent it to, to them because he was saying that if he didn't send it to them, that's ex parte communication. And, you know, that wouldn't be right. So he, he had to send it to them, too. And once they, he sent it to them, they was really just like trying to get me off the case. And so when we went to court again, because heaven had been complaining about being messed with again and being treated bad. The school had been calling the um, PCA company that she was supposed to get back with. She never did get PCA for um, heaven. They kept calling um, the bus drivers and called and, and stuff like that. Matter of fact, one time the bus driver brought her to me because they thought that she was going to come back to me. They just swept it under the rug and dropped the case. And then when the uh, PCA company called again, they told them the, the case was closed. So they wouldn't even investigate a new allegation, let alone reopen the old ones. Nope, not at all. And when when they took her from because they had they were supposed to get her that Wednesday is when we went to court. They kept her with me to Friday. Then they came and got her. Now, if I'm so bad for her, why you leave her with me two extra days? Right. Then they said that they was going to give it to the other aunt, the one who had the son, give heaven to her. And they didn't. They took her right back down the street to her. They, I mean, they lied to the judge and everything, but I couldn't say nothing. The judge who I had wrote the letter to, he wasn't on the, he had retired. He wasn't even on the bench anymore. It was somebody else. So they didn't even know anything, and they just listened to them saying, I'm interfering with the reunification process. He said, well, if she's doing that, then you need to remove her. And they knew that I was not doing that. And then when I had talked to the guardian at Lightham and I talked to her worker, and I said, if you give her back to her mom, she's going to die, and the blood going to be on your hands. I told them that many times. I even wrote 
I emailed a letter to all the supervisors and I and I just asked, uh, please, would you just reconsider? And they were like, um, well, we have to do this and stuff. And the thing of it is, is that they were saying that she was compliant, but she was not compliant. Truth be told, I don't even really think that she really wanted heaven back. The only reason why she wanted heaven back, heaven was the money. This all reminds me so much of another story I did about 50 some episodes ago, but everything that you're telling me is is the same. It's a different state, but the same thing. They, you know, the warnings from the family members and everything else. And it's just so common. It is. It is. And I looked up like the children that's getting hurt and stuff like that. It's not a lot of people covering those stories. Exactly. It really is sad. You know, that's why I started my blog a few years ago and and the podcast. The stories are so much more important and people are so afraid to hear them because it kind of shakes up their view of the world, I think. And if we don't know about the abuse that's going on, then how can we prevent it? Right. But you know what? Like me, my daughter and my mother, we had PTSD. Like every time we hear a phone ring, we would get nervous. It just was a lot. It was a lot. And I mean, and I tried everything that I possibly could and more. Like I said, when they told me I couldn't speak in court, I wrote a letter. I mean, I I talked to people and stuff because I'm a community organizer. So I know a lot of people. I know a lot of politicians and everything. And I spoke to them. Even, you know, a couple of them, they were they were being told that I was trying to stop her from going to her mom and stuff. I was doing that on purpose and stuff. But I was not. I knew in my soul. I knew because I was I would even Google her when when she moved to Virginia. I would even Google her. And my daughter, one time she was on my computer and she pressed H and Heaven Watkins popped up and she said, Mom, why are you Googling heaven? I said, because she's going to be in the news. And two weeks later, she was in the news. It's not the kind of thing you want to be able to say, I told you so. But mm-hmm. I, I didn't never have to be right about that. Right. And I just look at her potential. She was learning. She was learning so much. And then when she went back to her mother, she got back on the Pampers. Mm-hmm. She got back on the insure. Cause she had lost so much weight and stuff. And that right there should have told them something. Cause like I was telling them, y'all don't have to give her to me, give her to somebody else. Don't give her to her mom. Right. Exactly. They would have seen similar growth. I would think maybe not exactly the same. You guys really put a lot of work into helping her and giving her what she needed. And, but at the very least she wouldn't be malnourished or on Pampers again. Right. Or cause she was like, she was completely potty trained and everything. I mean, I had a, the doctors wrote letters saying that, you know, she should stay with us for a little while longer and stuff. And truth be told, we had, me and Latoya had came to an agreement. Child protection is the one, I believe, that threatened her and said, well, you're not going to get this and you're not going to get that. And then she changed her mind. That's how hard they're pushing for reunification is they tried to change her mind. Yes. That's unbelievable. That's the real shame is that they're pushing so hard for reunification that, just like you said, they're not actually working in the best interest of the child. Right. And that's supposed to be their objective. Exactly. I'm so sorry this happened to you and to heaven. She just, you're right. She had a lot of potential for her to learn and grow and develop so quickly in Mm -hmm. your care and your daughter's care. It's obvious she had a lot more potential than her mother ever thought. Yes. At what point was your brother out of the house? Because I know that at some point he wasn't he wasn't in the equation as far as CPS. Yeah. So what happened was so when they took heaven, he was still there. When they took the other girls, he left. Okay. That's when they were talking about drug selling and stuff. But my whole thing of it is, is this. He never got convicted of that. He never went to jail for that. He never even got charged with that. So I think that that should be said. I'm not going to like, you know, downplay anything or stuff, but he never got in trouble for that, you know, and he has a nice job and a career and stuff. And I don't want, and then he did a lot of feeling sorry and stuff too. But what I can say for him is he knew that he couldn't give his kids what we could give them. So he, he stepped out the way. He actually asked you to take them, right? Yeah. 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 That's really sad. And you're right. It needs to be mentioned that he really did try to help her in that way by by putting her somewhere that she would be cared for like he knew you would. Because you know what happened is when that stuff happened, 
they put all that about my brother. They didn't put nothing. All they said was about Latoya is, is she did what she was supposed to, which that was not true. And they put all that stuff about my brother to get the eyes off of them. And that was CPS. Yes, yeah, CPS. Because he was trying to talk with them and communicate with them. They would not call him back or do nothing. Because, see, if if the, he would have did that, then he could have said, hey, I want my daughter with my my sister. Right. They didn't want to hear that because it didn't uh, fit their narrative. Exactly. Where did they get that information that they claimed he was selling drugs and putting them in one of the girls' backpacks and things like that? It was the son's backpack. It was um. They got it from. They got it from him. They they got it from her son. And then a, a couple of years before that even happened, Heaven had said that my brother had slapped her in the face, and they had came to the to his place because we so happened to be over there, and um they came and and got my brother, and then they seen Heaven like. Cause heaven would like bump her head and, and stuff like that. And they seen heaven do the, the police saw her do that. And so they didn't never stick no charge on. They just think about that. Be, but heaven was self harm sometime. Just out of frustration or, or whatnot. Yeah. But that was like, did nothing even happen out that charge. That was the 2012 restraining order and that whole yeah, situation. Yeah. Okay. So the charges there were just dismissed. Yeah. But that's what they put out there. They didn't find anything with that and with him, like, hitting her and stuff like that. They they didn't find any of that. One thing about heaven, too, heaven knew people. Heaven knew what she can get away with and, <laughs> and knew what she could say and, and knew who to go to when she needs something. And, you know, she knew people underestimated her. But we didn't, because we know <laughs> I knew better. No, we did not underestimate her. We took her to the circus, and she was like, I see what they finna do. I was like, just look and see. And then she was like, oh, you see that? I was like, yeah. She, I was like, just look and see. And then she was like, she's like, oh, you see, that was nice, wasn't it? I was like, yeah. She was like, auntie. I said, huh? She said, am I being good? I was like, yes, baby. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> I said, you're being the best. And she was like, thank you. And she gets hugged and kissed me and stuff. Yeah. And then, like, if you would ask her stuff, because she, she would always tell me, my mother, and my daughter, thank you for taking such good care of me. And so if we ask her something, like I say, heaven, did you do such and such? She said, is she going to stop taking good care of me? And I tell her, no, nah, it ain't nothing you can do that's going to make me stop taking good care of you. She was like, I did it. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that she would ask you guys that kind of a question and, and are you going to let anyone hurt me? Those kind of things. And that poor girl. Yeah, when my mother would do the prayer with her and she say, if I should die before I wake, she had to take that out. She say, that, you going to let somebody kill me? And my mom was like, no, I'm not going to let nobody kill you. And then my mom, she feel bad because she's like, I let somebody kill. I said, no, you didn't. CPS let somebody kill her. Yeah, I imagine it's hard not to blame yourself, but you tried so hard. Yeah, I was doing that too, cause it, sure. Yeah, my my cousin was like, "You did everything, but kidnap heaven, you couldn't do none of that." I was, so you did everything. I was like, I just felt, cause you know, like I said, I'm I'm a community activist, and I never like lost anything, like far as what I'm fighting for and stuff like that. I done had fights with foreclosure and um just a lot of different other stuff, but this was the thing that did me in. It's like. I didn't even engage in my community for the longest. The only thing I was focused on was heaven, but I, you know, I did the, um, the parent leadership so I can help change policies and how they do things and connect it with the kinship care people. But as far as like anything else and stuff, I just was so disappointed in the system. Yeah, of course. It'll change your entire viewpoint. Yeah. I'm just not starting to get back working. When heaven passed, I just kind of concentrated on that, you know, um, helping with the heaven's law. And then I got a dedication. I'm a, I was a, um, a editor, a community editor for, um, St. Paul Almanac. And so we got, um, heaven's dedication in there and I wrote her a poem. And then, um, 
I was also a part of, um, it's called Poetry in the Park After Dark, and I had did a poem about black bean salad, and I had the artist, because we was paired with artists, I had the artist draw heaven with the ingredients of the black bean salad floating over her head. So that's a poster and stuff, too. She loves singing and stuff, and I know if she would still be around, she would be singing better and better, because she practiced all the time. Her voice was beautiful. Yeah, just right. Yeah, she just seemed so happy with you and just so well cared for. She was. Yeah, my daughter, because like, like I said, she was so far behind. And so my my daughter became her PCA right away. But I, I took the, because like from February to September, she had like 50 appointments. Wow. And so I would take them. And as soon as my, as soon as we caught up with everything, then my daughter would just take her. And the money she would make from that, she spent it all back on heaven. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just, we just spoiled it. We had went to Vegas for my daughter's 21st birthday. And, um, the the kids was with my mom and stuff. And we had to buy extra suitcases because we had, <laughs> we had bought the girls so much stuff. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and like, I knew that my, my younger nieces, I knew that they would be okay because she treated heaven different. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Kids with special needs are abused at such a higher rate. And it's so awful and sad because they can't necessarily defend themselves the same right. or tell someone the same way, you know? So when you got heaven, was she, was she able to speak much? Oh Yeah. When we took her to speech therapy, they actually, because that's, you know, that's what they had sit, had on there, the recommendations and stuff. But they actually said that we could stop bringing her to speech therapy because she was that, because she would say, let me see your phalanges. And she'll show her, her phalanges. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, um, because my daughter would work with her on her vocabulary and stuff. So now nah, she didn't, the speech therapy. Mm-mm. So it sounds like she talked a lot. <laughs> and yep. And we would do the quiet game. At first, she couldn't win. And then um, all of a sudden, we'd be like, okay, heaven, come on. We're going to do the quiet game. And she will win. So you could tell she was getting more patient because she had um, PTSD, too. Oh, okay. So you could tell she was getting more patient. She was listening because she would have outbursts in school and stuff. And then me and my daughter would journal like how she did that morning if she was having a good day. And then they would journal back. And heaven loved tape. So if we knew having had a long piece of tape, we knew she had a, a good day. Okay. So that was her thing. Scotch tape. Scotch tape and hauls. <laughs> she loved hauls. The cough drops. Yep. She loved hauls and she loved the scotch tape and stickers. She she was a candy person too, but if if, it, if she had a choice between hauls and candy, she would pick the hauls. Really? Yeah, I think it's the mental I think it soothed her because of the mental lifters. Yeah, they probably did. Oh, that's so funny, though. What a <laughs> that's so cute and so unique. I love that detail. <laughs> yeah, she was. Yeah, like I said, we just talk about her all the time. I got two lamps with shelves on there, and it's just dedicated to her. She got I got her pictures. My family had made like a candle with her picture on there and stuff like that. And um, they had got me a um a picture frame with with heaven on there and stuff. And then her school had got us a little lighthouse with a candle in there and it said because somebody we love is in heaven and then i got her pictures and um my daughter bought me a a 3d cube with me in heaven in the picture that lights up and stuff and um yeah she had brought me that because like for the first two years i was just a mess i i cried every day it just was really hard yeah yeah definitely and um, my my daughter had she did like a surprise healing circle for me. She had invited some friends of mine, and they cooked and stuff, and you know just surrounded me because I had a hard time. I had a, I really had a hard time. And my mom, my daughter too. My daughter, I think she just was trying to be strong for us. My mother, like now, she she says she feel heaven, like heaven's trying to tell her or have us to do something. So I said, well, maybe this is it. It's amazing. Everything that you have done before and after, it's just inspiring. Did you try to get the Heaven's Law passed? It was in Minnesota or in Virginia? It got passed in Virginia. It didn't get passed in Minnesota. Change in law is, is huge, and that's amazing. And they, they have a law. It wouldn't be 
heaven's law per se, but it's still a piece of heaven's law that actually they trying to get it for all the states. And I don't know the progress of that bill because um they talked about that. I think it was last year. They even said her name on the Senate floor. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so hopefully if that get passed, it wouldn't be called heaven's law, but a piece of heaven's law would be in there because everybody will have to do like the database. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I, I've seen so many stories where parents move just to avoid CPS and the nationwide database would be such a huge step. In February, you know, she had got burnt and um, the mom had birthed her. And they still sent her back home. She was in the hospital for six days. She had to get skin graft. They still sent her back home. Now, the Mott's cousin had told me that Heaven had said she did not want to go back there. And they still sent her back there. I can believe it because Heaven didn't hold nothing in. Like, if she wanted to say something and stuff like that, she would just say it. I don't think she really had, like, a filter with that. If she, Because, like, when I saw her, I saw it twice after she left my house. One time I saw it in person and she came and hugged me and she said, how's poetry doing? I want to go back down to your house. And I just had to fight back tears. And I said, well, you can come next time and stuff, you know, and I just had, I hated lying to her and telling her that. And then I saw her one other time after that, but I didn't let her see me because I didn't want her to ask that. And then after that, I never saw her again. I see the other kids, but I never saw her and I knew something was going on. And then when when I found out that they were moving, because my daughter, she did a, a fake Facebook page to friend um, Latoya so that we know what's going on with the kids. And that's how we found that. So my daughter found out on Facebook and she called and told me. That's how you found out that she passed away. Oh, that's terrible. Because somebody else had knew the story and my friend called me because at first they was just saying she passed in her sleep. But we knew that we knew that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. That's what was coming out. And then my friend called me about four or something in the morning and was like, heaven was killed. And I just I was like, I knew it. It just hit me. I was like, I knew it. And I woke my mother and daughter up and told them and stuff. And it was just, like I said, it's just been a lot. Because, like, it wasn't just me, my mother, and, and my daughter. We were the primary kid. But, like, my whole family pitched in and stuff. My grandmother was sent money to say, oh, them little rascals can eat. And heaven loved ribs. Here's another fun story about her. So we was over at my grandmother's house for Easter and we had cooked food, and my grandmother had dead ribs and stuff. So Heaven asked my daughter, could you please give me some more ribs? She said, no, nah, eat the rest of your stuff, and then you can get some more ribs. So my daughter went out the room, and she went over to my grandmother's chair with her bone and said, she called the new granny. She said, new granny, could you put some more meat on here? <laughs> <laughs> she knew her way around. <laughs> So cute. She knows exactly what she wants and how to get yeah, it. How to get it, right. And then my daughter coming there, she had two big pieces of ribs on there. <laughs> and she said, leave her alone. She wanted me to put some more meat on there. And ever since then, like, when um, my grandmother goes shopping and stuff, she would make sure she buy having ribs. <laughs> oh, it's, she was just so cherished. And I, I'm so glad that she had that time with all of you. Yeah. You know, that she knew how it felt. And it's just heartbreaking that she had to go back when she didn't want to. And she knew it. Right. See, that's the thing I think I have the problem with. Because it's like, I wonder what was on her mind. Did she know, like, why my um auntie, cousin, and grandma not getting me? You know, that's what I always wondered, like, what was on her mind? Like, did she just think that we just said, oh, you just go back to her? Did she even know that we were fighting for it? You know, that that's one thing that stays on my, my heart. I dreamed about it one time because I had moved and um, I dreamed that she was in my bed and I was trying to wake her up and I started crying and she just grabbed my face and then she just disappeared. And I called my mom. I thought my mother was gone, but she had came back in the house and um, she was like, you need a hug. And then she just came in and hugged me. I was like, oh, I didn't even know you was in the house. <laughs> but I was telling my uncle about it and he was telling me, he was like, she trying to tell you it ain't your fault. I was like, I probably, but it was just heavy on my mind. 
Of course. I can only imagine what you've gone through and what's gone through your mind in all those years. And she'd be 15 this year. Yeah. I'm very sorry. You know, it's, I just hate that it's such a common thing to happen, that reunification is so important to the state for some reason. But you know what? The funny thing about it is I done witnessed parents jumping through hoops, doing everything, and they give them the hardest time. But the parents who act like they don't want, really don't want them, them the ones that get the kids back. And for Latoya, she she didn't seem to be doing things the right way. They would say, oh, she's doing what she's supposed to. And she wasn't. She wasn't. And like I said, they told me, like, well, if you see something, say something. And there was just a couple of things I said because I seen a lot more. But what they did was they put it that I reported it. But they was trying to make it look like I was lying on her. False reporting, right? Right. Yeah. That's so frustrating. And um, when everything happened, I emailed everybody I got in touch with trying to get her. I emailed and it's this one lady named Lisa. She was supposed to help me, but she found out one of her co-workers was helping Latoya. So they had told her the same thing. Like she's just doing that because um, she just want to keep having she don't want her to go back. And she believed it. And so when she found out that having passed away. Every time she see me, she just apologized. And I was like, no, it's, you didn't know because, of course, you're going to side with your coworker. You know, you didn't know me. You know, I just came for help. You know, somebody had referred me to her. And so she had gave me another resource, but I had already went to that resource before I had went to her. Like, when I tell you, I went up to the highest person and she just brushed me off, too. I asked to meet with her. She She did not want to meet with me. I sent her this poem that I wrote called Change the Name. And um, if I'm a, in charge of a unit and somebody write what I heard from somebody, I'm like, ooh, I need to meet with her because my, my staff is bad. I need to do something. But no, nope, she did not want to meet with me. It was just a horrible experience. And such a shame because for them to see that they did a lot of incorrect things during the process after the fact, it's too late. Yep. And then um, Latoya's friend even went up there and said something and they still didn't take heaven because at first she was mad at us, too. She thought that, you know, that we was just trying to be mean and take heaven and stuff. And then when she said that she was starving heaven and um, hitting heaven and stuff like that, she was trying to get her taken away. Another friend had told me when she had found out, she went up there and she went after the, the worker and wanted to talk to the worker and stuff. And they was trying to hush it up then. They, after that, they shut it down. They did not mention it no more or anything. They just swept it under the rug. Because when um the old guard in that light was going to report her death, and they said that, that death wasn't on them because it didn't happen in the state. Unbelievable. Their intervention could have prevented it completely. Exactly. I, I looked at Latoya's Facebook page and there were tons of pictures of the other girls and some of her son, but about three pictures in total of heaven throughout the years. And it just struck me. Yeah. And if you look, her niece and them was like, where's heaven at? Her niece was even asking that. I think one of her nieces had fought her because she was treating heaven wrong. But the thing of it is, is that if they would have said something, I believe if they would have said something, the one thing that they were supposed to be doing is saying that nobody that she know could be her um heaven's PCA. The first thing she did was to get the mont to be her PCA. Amazing. And that's as soon as she left the state. She left the state and then that's how they was able to get the place and stuff. Her cousin said I think he was getting three thousand dollars a month. And that was to quote unquote care for heaven. Yes. And they wasn't feeding her. But they was getting extra food stamps. Did Latoya meet DeMont in Minnesota or when she moved down there, she met him? He lived in Minnesota and then they, his family um, is from Virginia. So they went there with his family because she had got put out the house when she was staying down the street. She had got put out that because that was another thing. They had broke all the windows out. They reported that. They did not take them kids. Then they went over to Hennepin County, which is um, Minneapolis. So Ramsey was like, okay, they not our problem no more because it's Hennepin. So it was just a bunch of mess. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. That's where the, the system would come in handy for things to be communicated between counties, between states. Right.
she came in February. Her birthday was in April. So when she turned eight, she was with us. And when she turned nine, she was with us. So um, my daughter had gave her uh, her ninth birthday party was at Chuck E. Cheese. And then her um, her eighth, because it was her little sister's third birthday, then we gave theirs together because their birthday is just a couple weeks apart. We had did them a princess party and we did a sleepover and stuff. And even then, Latoya came to the party. Now, my brother had gave Latoya money for heaven and Mama. She bought Mama stuff. She did not buy anything for heaven. That's just awful. When we had Heaven's party, her birthday was on a Tuesday. So we had went up to her school. We had bought pizza and we did cake and stuff at her school because I never got a chance to do that for my daughter because her birthday is in the summertime. So I had did that for Heaven. And when she came back, um, her mom had bought her a cake. The cake was hideous. It did not look good. And she didn't buy her anything. And we had presents and stuff. And then she told her friend, like, they opened up the cake and they wasn't supposed to open up the cake. I'm like, the the party was going to be that Saturday. We can't keep no cake from Tuesday to Saturday. Yeah, bought her a cake and stuff. But she just felt bad because she didn't bring her nothing. And then she brought her all these dirty clothes. They supposed to have been new or something, but they had linen on them. It was just we just threw them things away. We did not give them to her. And like I said, when she just bought my mind, like Play-Doh, just all different type of stuff and didn't get having anything. I don't understand how she could do something like that in the open and think no one's going to think differently of her. You know, it's obvious she was not a good mom, particularly to heaven. She played a victim real good. Pull me this, that, and the other and stuff like that. She played a victim real good. But because I called her out on it, I was like, because um, my mom's teacher was there. And I, and I told her, I said, you treat your kids different. No, I don't. I said, yes, you do. And like I said, that's her, her niece even fought her about that because you could see that she was treated different. Heaven didn't even want to be with her. Heaven wanted to be with us. Well, I am so sorry that your families had to go through this and see the system for all its awfulness because you sure have seen the worst of it. Yeah. One last story. So my god sister, the last time she had seen heaven, because like heaven, like I said, she wasn't walking the first seven years of her life. She used to scoop like real fast and heaven would change her own pamper and everything. So my god sister had came to visit and she seen heaven running through the door and she just started crying because heaven was never walking and she had on underwear. She went to the bathroom. Oh, she just stopped. She was like, oh, my God. I never thought I'd see this baby walking. I mean, she was running to her. Wow. Yeah, my, my, my God sister just started crying. And she was like, wow, y'all done really did a lot. And a lot of it, you know, my daughter, when she took over as PCA, she did it right by heaven. Heaven and Akilah's boy, they were so funny, like, Heaven would want her hair in a poof. She'll call it a poof, like a little ponytail. She says, I don't want all that in my hair. I just need a poof right there. (laughs) And they'll be arguing. And I'll be like, just give her her poof. (laughs) (laughs) The girl knows what she wants. (laughs) Right. Thank you so much to Sharonda for talking to me about her incredibly special niece, Heaven, and for ensuring Heaven did not die in vain, working hard to make changes to protect other kids like Heaven in the future. I really enjoyed talking to Sharonda, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. Finally, I'd like to play for you a recorded audio story Sharonda shared with me about Heaven's life and legacy. They say things happen to you, and as they happen to you, it can change your life for the good or for the bad. And I met this little girl named Heaven. She was born in 2007, and she was she was actually born one pound and seven ounces. And as she got bigger, she just became an inspiration because... She didn't start walking until she was seven years old, but she was scoot around the house like with the quickness. She wasn't potty trained until she was seven, but she would change her own pampers. 
she just persevered. She never like let anything limit her. She was the sweetest person. She just cared about everybody. Heaven picked up really quick. You know, they they would often say she had a mind of a two or three year old. But that was not true. Heaven could talk to you and size you up and know what to say and do. And she had this wisdom that a lot of people don't have. Um, one time, my daughter had gave her an allowance of five dollars, and they was downtown. They went to Candyland, and they she saw a, a homeless lady. She asked the lady, "Why do you have your stuff on the floor?" And she said, um, "Well, I don't have a house." So Heaven reached in her pocket and gave her the five dollars and said, "Here, go buy you a house." And the lady did not want to take the money, but my daughter had told her to take the money. And so they still went to Candyland. And needless to say, by the time Heaven was through, she had $15 because I gave her five. <laughs> my mother gave her five and Akilah had gave her five to replace it. <laughs> Everybody knew Heaven. The first five minutes, you know who Heaven was. We took Heaven to the family reunion and it was it had to be at least... 25 kids there but even my uncle and all of them who was in their 90s where they having at <laughs> they just knew it because heaven she said what was on her mind no matter how much trouble she got into she was gonna say what was on her mind um she would always come home and she'll say auntie Somebody was cussing on the bus. I say, who was cussing on the bus? I me. <laughs> and I say, stop cussing on the bus. Have you not supposed to cuss on the bus? Okay. My mother had some chocolate on the counter. She come back. Heaven got chocolate all on her mouth, all on her hands. She say, Heaven, what happened to my chocolate? Poetry ate it. And poetry is the cat. <laughs> My mother said, well, poetry don't get it. <laughs> her and poetry was such good friends. He would jump in the bed with her, and I would chase, always chase him out the bed. And then she just said, that's okay, auntie. He can cuddle with me. So then he would just lay with her, and they would go to sleep. And one thing that I love about heaven, she used her creativity um, to just really to tell her story and she loved to sing and every time she'll meet somebody and stuff she'll sing your name and she would sit on the couch in the living room and just listen to smooth jazz and scat because she had music therapy and she loved music two of her favorite things I always say that kid is so weird she loved Halls Smith the Lifters cough drop and tape just just the scotch tape stickers was okay but she just preferred to have tape so like heaven would go to school and we could tell what type of day she would have by the length of tape so if she got a little piece we'd be like heaven what you do <laughs> but if she got a long piece she's like auntie i had a good day today and she loved school. No matter how much she cut up in school, you know, we would tell her if she don't act right, she wasn't going to school. And she would act right. She <laughs> loved school. And the teachers loved her. The students loved her. And like I said, that girl was a handful too. She would be fussing and cussing and stuff. And then I remember one time she was, she was cussing at school. Um, she didn't know they had called. And then... I said, heaven. She was like, auntie. <laughs> and she straightened up real quick. <laughs> One time we had took her to the circus. And she say, auntie, what they finna do? I said, just look at it, heaven. And she said, ooh, you see that, auntie? Here come the elephants. She was like, ooh. And you know how they had like the little princesses and stuff come out there and stuff. So she was like, look at the princesses. And, and she was like really getting excited. She was eating popcorn and we was eating fruit snacks and stuff. And then she just looked over at me and said, auntie, am I being good? 
And I was like, yes, baby, you are being wonderful. When we first got her, like, she had a lot of anxiety and she had, like, her attention span was like this. And then she started getting more patient. You know, we would play the, because I remember, like, her and her siblings, we'd say, okay, we finna play the quiet game. And she'd say, we finna play the quiet game? Okay, I'm finna be quiet. We finna start right now? Okay. Did I win yet? (laughs) And then, you know, as time progressed, I said, okay, have we finna play the quiet game? And she would actually be quiet. And then, I remember one time I had said something. She said, I won, I won. (laughs) And we would go to my grandmother's house and heaven loved ribs. She loved to eat, period, but she loved ribs. So... She had ate her rib, and she had asked my daughter, she said, Keith, can I have some more food? And she said, well, eat the rest of your stuff, then you can get another rib. So Akilah went out the room, and she took the bone to my grandmother. She called my grandmother New Granny. She said, New Granny, could you put some more meat on this bone? (laughs) And when and when when Akila came back, needless to say, it was two pieces of <laughs> ribs on the <laughs> on the plate. And she said, "Grandma," she said, "Hey, that baby asked me to put some more meat on the bone. I'm gonna get her." <laughs> and so every time my grandmother would go get ribs, she would always send some for heaven, cause heaven loved ribs. Ribs and pizza was her favorite. You know, I had her for 18 months. Then she was, um, she went back home with her mom. And shortly after they had moved to Virginia, in May of 2018, um, she was beat to death by her mom and her mom's boyfriend. But um, she left a legacy of Heaven's Law came into existence on March 18th. I'm sorry, March 18th. Um, 2019 and it's, it's going to start in July and that's going to be in Virginia but we're working on Heaven's Law here and we're actually going to Washington so it will be in all 50 states so even in death she's helping people she's being empathetic to people and she's caring about people one of the things that I was really proud of is that Heaven's Law was unanimous 97 to 0, Republicans and Democrats pushed for this bill. The governor signed it, and it was came into existence in 10 months. And if you know anything about wanting to pass laws and stuff, 10 months is a relatively short time for it to happen. And I'm just so proud that I had her in my life because... Even just thinking about her and the things she do, she makes me smile. When I'm sad, she makes me smile. And even when I used to fuss at her, she would say or do something and I just would crack up and I couldn't be mad anymore. (laughs) So I have tons of memories and tons of stories that will be passed down um, so people can know about this wonderful young lady who had a disability, but did not let that stop her one bit. My sources for this episode were Dr. Sharonda Orridge, GoFundMe, Facebook, the Virginia Judiciary Online Case Portal, and YouTube. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCpod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. 
All music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.